Oh, Linda, you're muted. We are featuring Fiberworks tonight at our gallery talk. And we have some very exciting artists to talk with you about their passion for fiber and their work with body adornment. Without further ado, we're gonna to go to multi-talented multimedia, Marjorie Erickson. I'm not sure if I'm on the screen yet. I still see Linda. So I'm waiting until I see myself, but I can start talking. I can okay. hear you, Marjorie. Okay, all right. I'm not sure what the view is. I see speaker view, so I am speaking, just waiting if someone's gonna spotlight me or whatever. There we go. You Thank are. you. <laughs> now you can see me. Hello, everyone. I'm Marjorie Erickson, and I live in Hanover, Pennsylvania. I'm going to show you what we're doing in the two classes I'm teaching, and then I'm gonna go on and explain the rest of my life, I guess, is what I'll say it. I'm gonna go to screen share. I didn't test it out on this one, but let's see how it works. I think I have the ability. All right, good. All right, give it a moment. There you go. All right, I hopefully everyone can see this. Yes. All right, so we are, the one class I'm doing is beginning knitting. Now we have decided that beginning knitting is a gateway craft, you know, get you involved and then you wanna try some other things. So most of the time, right now, we have people that are knitting this particular piece here and they're learning a lot of stitches. I have a few students are doing something like this and that is my morning class. The afternoon class, we're doing kumahimo bead, um, braiding, which is typically not done on this kind of a disc with all these numbers and everything. It's normally a wooden disc with no numbers, a hole in the middle, takes a lot of concentration. So we've kind of updated it. And what you see here are some of the products that the students will finish by the end of this week. Now I'm gonna go on to what I do. I'm actually a hand weaver. There's my in introduction. I have a lot of slides, but I'm gonna go right through them very quickly. This is uh, some of the fiber that we dye. So I do actually dye some of the fiber that's used for spinning and felting. This is my studio with the Frisbee on the roof, I see. I didn't know which picture I took. <laughs> then sometimes outside the studio, you'll see that we hang some of the fiber, yarn, fabric, whatever out to dry. Inside the studio, to give you a little idea, these are the looms that I use. I have, as you can see right now, there are four of them. So basically what I do is a lot of weaving to educate people as to where fabric came from and how it's made. A lot of times people come up to me and they'll say, oh, wow, that takes a long time. And I'll start to explain, yes, a long time ago, people didn't have lots of clothing to wear. Okay, another view. Because it took so long to make and some more fun colors. I love fun colors. And these are things that people can either, like I said, spin, felt with, or perhaps if you'd like to weave with them, you can do that also. This shows the process. Sometimes I might offer a dyeing class. So we actually use mason jars to do it. Over here, the fibers in the mason jars and pop them in a microwave. It's nothing that they had in, long time ago. And then it's outside drying. And this is what this looked like when it was done. This one I called an autumn, one of the autumn colors. Now this is the yarn that's been dyed before it goes on the loom. Another educational process for people to understand that we have to measure the yarn and do some other things just to get things on the loom. Some samples of some towels that were just done. There they are still on the loom. And I explain to people, if you go to the fabric store, you'll see bolts of fabric. That's actually what's happening here. I'm creating a bolt of fabric. And if I have a loom somewhere, we'll go through all the parts and explain what's happening, how 
the yarn, the threads go up and down by using the treadles and throwing the shuttle back and forth. So a lot of education. So if I'm at a craft show, you might see a loom or you might see a spinning wheel along with me. Now, I'm not sure if this is, I think this was a video, but I'm not going to go through it. I'm going to see a click and see what happens here. No, it won't happen. All right. So what this is, is what I call it warps end. So a lot of times I will do a video and I will show how the fabric rolls off. Again, rolling off the loom, so to speak. This is some of the fabric that was just taken off. These are going to be hate to say it, hand or dish towels, but some people just say uh, you can put them on the table. Often the products, the material I use is cotton. This is all 100% cotton. Some more of those. And we talk about the design elements sometimes depending on who's there. And they're all stacked up ready. What's fun is all the different colors and also talk about how things are changed because weaving is really different than when you do painting and things because blending the fibers together is a, quite different. One of my helpers there, some more yarn. I also did uh, Wafa on a face, uh, Facebook group and we did uh, dyeing, I, we did a demo. So on the class, I showed the, stu the students or the demonstration how to dye the yarn. So that's another thing that we'll go through the process of. This is that yarn when it's all done, it's all been dyed, ready to go on the loom finished product. Basically was able to make two, I think two scarves and two cowls out of that. This again is a, this was a blend of a rayon and bamboo and cotton yarn. It's always fun to have a little spark of color. Again, cotton seems to be the thing a little bit. This is actually recycled cotton. So we can also buy recycled cotton and use it. And that's what the stripes are made out of. Some more pictures, it's fun to take pictures. Another warp that was dyed. I'm not sure if I have that. And this was one of the two that were on the loom. And again, I have a little video, but we don't have time for that. I often put little short videos up on the internet so people can actually watch and see what's going on. And I do have a YouTube, YouTube channel for educational purposes, as well as you know, just to help people uh, see what's going on. It's always fun. You can see how when the yarns on the loom, it changes color, which is a lot of fun. It doesn't get too boring to uh, weave those. And then this is one of my latest products. It's a lot. This is Tencel made from tree pulp. And I kind of took a picture of all the fabric before it was washed. There it's all done, made into some ponchos. Some bamboo that was made last year. And I think this is my last one. Can also do some scarves. Oh, there we go. That's the last one. So we also make some fabric out of things. So I just wanted to share those with you. And I will stop the screen share. And I am back. So now you know more than you need to know about me. <laughs> Thank you, Marjorie. That was wonderful. Marjorie does several shows in the community. If you like her work, you can find her at Mistletoe Mart. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of, we're very fortunate to have some shows that are happening live. Um, we're going to continue with Gail Matthews, who's one of my partners at Off Track Art. You can see lots of Gail's wonderfully imaginative uh, creatures there. Uh, and she also is a fan of fiber and has a great studio. Take it away, Gail. All right. Thank you. Um, as you can see behind me, that is a very small selection of my fiber. I have probably about 200 different colors, types, um, silks. Anyway, lots and lots of fiber. Yeah, I can't keep my hands off from it. Um, this is what we've been doing in our class today. Uh, excuse me, this week. We are making needle felted wool sculptures. And this is mine. And there's a barn owl. And this is how far we've gotten so far. We've got the head done. We got the body done, the front, and then the feet. And this is one that the, the, the light that I've got on is washing this out. But it, um, that one's got the back done. So we're having a good time. I think the students are really enjoying it. And that is what I do. I sculpt with wool. 
Um, but in last year, I talked about the amazing properties of wool. Wool is just, wool is incredible. And when I did a little research on wool last year, I go, my goodness, I had no idea. It's just a really a miracle product. Um, that was my topic last year. What I'm going to talk about tonight is something completely different. We're talking about perspective, I guess. And I want to share with you a little bit of my the, uh, personal growth journey and how I got started and why I almost quit. So tonight, you are looking at a turtle on a fence post. That would be me. Alex Haley is quoted as saying, if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know it had help getting up there. When I consider that just a couple years ago, I had no idea I would be a teacher for Common Ground. I'm just astounded by all the people who have put, helped put me up on this fence post where I am today. I could never, ever have gotten there by myself. And if I started naming all the people who, who've helped me, that would be about eight minutes and I'd have to sign off. So um, I'll just say thank you to everybody at large in general and, and move on. Our lives are a series of choices and one choice leads to another choice. And according to whatever you choose to do, doors open or doors close. When I first started needle felting, I made the choice to buy a couple kits, take some online tutorials and I made a few mice and other small animals. Then I chose to take a live class with the same instructor, which led to another choice. That choice was to quit. I felt my work did just not measure up and I was discouraged. I kind of wallowed in fear and self-pity for about two years. Making that choice was based on fear and it was based on, believe it or not, pride. I stayed safe, you might say, because a turtle in his shell cannot be criticized. But that choice kept me on the ground where turtles belong. Now that may sound like a humble position, but staying on the ground, being a turtle, was a decision I had made that kept me grounded and it was not made to my best uh, advantage. It was a decision made out of pride because I was too proud to fail and look bad even for a moment. So I pulled in my head, my tail, my feet, and I stayed in my shell. One thing in this journey I've learned is that it's important enough to be humble to be willing, uh, it's important to be humble enough to be willing to fail. Being proud is what kept me just average and not producing anything. But I still wanted to get up on that fence post and I kept looking at it and wishing I could get up there, thinking, well, what if, what if I could do something, get up there, but wishing never got a turtle up on a fence post. So, after about two years of um, not doing anything, I picked up my work again and with determination and practice, I improved. <laughs> so practice added skill and skill, uh, suddenly this turtle, very uncharacteristically for me, I stuck out my neck and I started to move forward. Well, I did what most turtles do. I stuck out my neck and I started going forward. And what happened was little by little, many helping hands came along, crossed my path providentially and started giving me a boost up. Now, I don't want to be misinterpreted or misunderstood. That perspective for, for my progress is not made out of pride. It's made out of humility because I didn't get there up, up there by myself. I just made a decision to go forward. I had to change my perspective from looking at others, making comparisons, and then being discouraged and retreating to a safe place inside my little shell. And then I had to change my, and I had to change my perspective to match my desire to actually grow. And so I made a decision to pick up my needles and my wool and my felting pad and try again. I'm happy to I'm happy to be here on this fence post, but I know that the more I practice, I will be moved up to a higher fence post eventually. So that's kind of exciting to me to know that 
um, sticking your neck out and going forward and accepting the challenge and not letting um, discouragement, fear, self-pity, pride, any of the negative things keep you in your shell. <laughs> you can go forward and do things that you never thought you could do. Well, I'm a creative being created by the great creator. So it's only natural that I would reflect the desire to be creative myself. I've always had a creative itch, but I never trained it. I never nurtured it. I was not educated in it, but it never went away. So why did I choose felting as my medium? Wool. Well, one day I saw an ad for a book on needle felting. I'd never heard of it before alongside an article about knitting, which I am a knitter also. Um, so I clicked on it on the internet and the rest is history. And you know, when I clicked on that book, something clicked in my head and I said, this is what I wanna do. And in many ways at my age, it was like, I mean, to start drawing or painting, which I had done in the past a little bit, you know, I, I, I suppose I could have, but this was something I knew I could do and I love fiber. So it was a good fit for me. So in fits and starts, stops, I started my needle felting journey and as a great side benefit, a personal one of personal growth also. The animals I make bring a smile to people's faces. They really do. In fact, just last week, when I was uh, doing my shift at Off Track Art, a couple came in and I noticed she was looking at my work quite a long time. And I said quietly, that's my stuff. And she replied that last year she had bought a bunny because it made her smile. And that is why I do what I do to make people smile. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. That was wonderful personal journey. We're gonna switch from wool, but we're gonna stay with, with body adornment as we look at the beadwork of Joanne Bost. <laughs> Hello, I'll start over again unmuted. Um, I'm Joanne Bast. I do beadwork among other things. I do have one theory about beadwork. I love working with beads. If I take my work and to it attach a needle and thread, put the needle through a bead, put the needle through my work, pull the thread, and the bead doesn't fall off, it's right. So, saying that, there are some specific ways in which beads can be attached together, and they're called beadwork stitches. And what we did this week is take a series of beadwork stitches and just learn how to do the stitches and learn what the stitches are good for because some of the stitches have advantages in one direction and others are advantageous in another. So I'm going to share my screen now but my internet has been cutting in and out so I'm going to hope keep my fingers crossed that I get through this. Okay, how do I, that one, ah, I go, okay, I keep forgetting which is the right things to talk, to deal with. Two of the very common beadwork stitches are called peyote and brick stitch. The peyote is the green sample. In this case, all the little holes are lined up horizontally and the bead thread goes from one bead and then into the row below and through a new bead and into the row below and through a new bead. So you get a staggered look to the bead stitches. In this way you can get diagonal lines and you can get vertical lines but you cannot get a good horizontal line. The blue sample is called brick stitch. In this case, the holes of the beads are lined up parallel to either each other and they're standing up like little soldiers. In this way, you can get horizontal lines and diagonals, but you can't get the verticals. 
The interesting thing about brick and peyote stitch is that if you turn one on its side, it looks exactly like the other one. Okay? So if you're working on a piece in either one of these stitches and you decide instead of working up, you want to work off the side, you just switch to the other stitch. Here's some necklaces that I did that are a combination of brick and peyote stitching. In the green one, that center area is brick. You can see how the holes of the beads are all lined up parallel. But when I got to the edge of the large green beads, I wanted to work off to the side, and so I switched to peyote stitch. In the geometric, depending on what I wanted the piece to look like, and I tried to copy the lines in the glass piece that's featured, I used either brick stitch or peyote stitch. They're not exactly interchangeable. If you look at the little cup on the side, brick stitch has more thread per bead, so it gives you a stiffer structure and is good for pieces that need to stand upright. Peyote stitch has less thread per bead and gives a much softer, drapier structure. And the jellyfish uh, on the right side has peyote stitch tentacles where I have increased every stitch in order to give a spiral look, and those are very soft and drapey. Okay, brick stitch has another interesting quality in that you start with something called a bead ladder. And if you look at the tap sole on the left, you can see the letters curve around in a very amorphous manner. You can take this original bead ladder, squish it into any shape you want, and fix the shape by increasing on one side and decreasing on the other. Uh, the picture on the right is, I think, recognizable to most of you. I, re, uh, um, I, I did Van Gogh's Starry Night in beadwork, and you can see that there's a lot of curves and a lot of circles and a lot of stitching in various different directions. When you do a picture in peyote stitch, it turns out to be very pixelated. So one of the advantages of brick stitch in doing a picture is that you can deal with curves. Here's some curved figures. There's a petroglyphic figure on the left where you can see the horns were established with a curve and then decreased on the inside to fix the curve. On the right is a large piece, uh, 12 by 19 inches, that I did for the Fiber Art Guild of Pittsburgh. It's the face of a, a, a the playing card, the Six of Clubs. They did a benefit where they sold a deck of playing cards where each artist did a different card. And, and this has six nightclub dancers, the Charleston, uh, the swing, and the disco from three different eras. In addition to brick stitch, these pieces also have a third type of stitch called right angle weave. In right angle weave, there are no straight lines. The basic structure of right angle weave is a circle of four beads or a multiple of four beads. I use it as a background stitch for two reasons. One, it's very flexible. It's almost an entirely bias structure so that you can drape it and cover an irregularly shaped object such as the rock on the left. It also does not give you distracting lines. The circle of four beads kind of make an amorphous structure that allow the straight lines of the brick stitch to stand out and be your foreground and your image. Okay, this is right angle weave on the left. The top is a circle of four beads. As you go down, you see it's looser. That's a circle of eight beads. You can make your circle of any multiple of four beads. If I would hold that by the corner, it would drape like a handkerchief. A fourth stitch that we dealt with is called square stitch. 
And the right piece, uh, the piece on the right, the red piece, is square stitch. If you can look at the square stitch, you can see that the beads line up directly on top of each other not staggered like they do in peyote and brick stitch. Uh, these, this way, you get a good horizontal and a good vertical and a pretty good diagonal as well. One of the advantages of the square stitch is doing letters. You get easily uh, legible letters when you have both a horizontal and a vertical line. On the left are some duffel bags I did with luggage tags of different conflicts that we've been into in the past oh, many years. The one standing up is done in peyote stitch. The one laying down is done in brick stitch. But in both cases, the lettering on the luggage tags is done in square stitch. If you take a look at the ballet shoe, this is also a mix of stitches. The ballet shoe itself, being kind of an irregular object, is covered with right angle weave. There's some lines that are a little difficult to see. They're kind of a lime green that cover the, that, that outline the seams on the ballet shoe. Those are brick stitch because that gives me straight lines. If you look inside the shoe itself, there's a cord done with peyote stitch that fills in the seam between the base of the shoe and the side of the shoe. And then the ribbons uh, that have the lettering are square stitch. And the letters read the princesses of ballets with uh, Cinderella, Titania, Juliet, Scheherazade, and so on. I guess that's it, but I really like combining these stitches and making things, thinking about them, and using each stitch to its own best advantage. Okay. I can't find my, there's my cursor. Okay. And we made it through and I didn't freeze up. So now if my internet fails, at least you guys won't see it. You did great. Um, this is Allie, the voice of the volunteer, but it looks like Linda might have accidentally got booted from the Zoom. Um, so whoever was uh, slated to go next, if you want to just introduce yourself and begin discussing your art, that would be great. I think it was I. I said I think it was me, but that's not correct. Um, so, hi. I'm good to go? Okay. I, I'm, I'm Judy Schoenbaum, and I am from Baltimore, but I now live in California. I've been in California a little bit more than 40 years, but I still have friends from Baltimore and a few friends here from Baltimore. Um, and... Um, uh, Actually, Oakland, I've been here seven years in Oakland, and it actually reminds me of Baltimore quite a bit in, in a really nice way. It's lots of diversity and lots, it's a small city, so you can go out to the countryside pretty quickly. Um, lots of art, lots of music, lots of education, lots of, lots of stuff. Um, so uh, I basically started out in art as a painter. Uh, no, that's not true. I started out as an art teacher and uh, in Vermont, and then I um, moved back to Baltimore, and I was an art teacher, and then I opened a picture frame shop in Bolton Hill, just up the street from the Maryland Institute, where Linda used to hang out a lot with all of her wild and crazy friends, who I really like, and, um, and then moved to California, and was doing picture framing, but what I did was I took my the, the mats, the inside of the mats that I cut for my picture framing, down to the beach with pastels, and started doing pastels, and did those for many, many years, and um, began working with an art agent, and she had me change from pastels to acrylic, and she took all the artwork all over the country, and sold it with other artists that she had in her stable. 
Um, I then ended up living in a little mountain town in Southern California, a very arty little town called Idlewild, and um, was doing my landscapes there. Um, then when the recession hit and there was no work, <laughs> no corporate work, a friend and I started doing little uh, recycling projects. And um, it, it really started to bother me. And this was the whole beginning of my recycling and creative reuse uh, path that stuff would go to the thrift store and if the thrift store couldn't sell it they would send it down to the goodwill down below in the mountains and if the mountain couldn't sell it they would send it to Mexico and who knows what happened there and it just drove me crazy because why are we wasting all this stuff and it, it, it's really it just started to affect me a lot and I also got a lot of um uh, enthusiasm from doing the recycling things and so I started teaching and because I love teaching I've always I've always been teaching whether it was drawing or picture framing and now creative reuse um, and uh, the class at Common Ground is so great uh, some of my old old friends from Baltimore are have been teachers there for a while so it's really like coming home it's really like Common Ground when I go back and actually teach in person which I'm looking forward to next year, as we all are. But the great thing about this year and the virtual stuff is that I can watch so many people and, and really take advantage of it more than just being there one week and teaching. So um, I know that, um, that my work is not going to change the world, but I really feel like it's my obligation as a human being to, in what I do, to make the world a little better. So I'm very passionate about teaching recycling. And the course that I taught this week was um, we did a different skill every day, which is a little crazy, except what my objective is, is to introduce people to all the possibilities. That's why it's Unknown Fabric Opportunities is the name of the class that Linda, I think Linda made this up, um, because everybody can do something. And just to become more conscious of reusing things and not wasting things and not polluting things and it really just really means a lot to me. Um, years and years ago when I taught in Vermont I was um, to get my certificate I had to take some classes and I was luckily taking classes at the Shelburne Museum Folk Art Museum in in Shelburne, Vermont. It was just it was a life-changing experience and studied all these old, um, old traditional skills and I always loved doing that. My mother was a dressmaker, so I always loved fabric, but I was really primarily a painter and a collage artist. But um, I found that in all this new interest in textile reuse, to take the traditional things and use ma current materials and current styles and sort of reinterpret it. So um, I do have some slides. I'll show you sort of the evolution of my stuff. And then I can also show you a couple. Here's some Here's some pieces. This is, um, we did uh, cardboard weaving was first. That's this little purse here. And I'm so ashamed to show it in front of Marjorie. <laughs> this weaving is really, really beautiful. But um, this is, my whole thing is like to just give everybody an introduction. Some people have never touched anything. And lots of things are simple. And if they end up doing more things and teaching other things, one of my students this week is a teacher an eighth grade English teacher and she wants to have some after school classes in her school is in Carroll County and um, and she wants to start some of this uh, recycling crafts and that's exactly that's exactly what it means to me it's like this circular way of exchanging all these things and making things really good so here's the first sample but it is lined it does have a strap and everybody was happy with that the second day we did crocheting this is a little baby hat and this is all made out of old clothes and I use a lot of plastic bags but not in the baby stuff but um, and this is nice because um, it's stretchy so when you when the baby gets bigger you put it in warm water and you stretch it out and stretch it out and, the, and a kid can wear this for several years so we did some this is this is my beret it's all the colors that I like to wear so when I don't have a nice um, fringy hair day, like Gail said, I just put this on and takes care of everything. The next day we did Amish nodding, 
which um, I've been trying to research why it's called Amish nodding, but I can't find out why. And But it's also called toothbrush nodding, toothbrush weaving. People used to take their old toothbrushes that had a little hole in the end that they would hang it up to dry and cut the brush off and file it down and, and you could use it for a tool. It's sort of like a, a it's not like a knitting needle or a crochet hook, but it's one simple tool that you use to make the stitch. So that's Amish knotting. Here's my attempt of, this is really finer Amish knotting and doing it in a rectangle. This was my first example. So in the, in the middle, you can see it's not really rectangular, but it's going to get there. And this is very thin. I use very, very thin um, strips. This is mostly t-shirts. And, um, and I would recommend, uh, when I first started doing this, I used to go and, and get uh, t-shirts at the thrift store and then realize as I got home, people can wear this. I shouldn't be tearing these apart. The people can actually wear this. So I decided that I only use things that cannot be worn anymore, that are kind of really too torn up or scraps of and, um, or fabric from larger bolts of things. So that was the Amish knotting. And then tomorrow we're going to do um, twining. And this is done on a loom, which looks like this. So you can make one. It's pretty easy to make one. And um, it's much stronger than any of the crocheting because you're usually you're using extra strands. Um, and I've seen tutorials of people making just absolutely gorgeous. You can see you can get a lot of different patterns from just the one basic stitch. Kind of like the beadwork. Actually, it's it's kind of similar to the beadwork that, um, I don't see your first name. Jo Joanne? Yeah. Joanne. Yeah, that Joanne was doing. So it's basically the same stitch, but you can make different different patterns. And then Friday, we're going to just have a sewing circle where we're going to just keep working on the stuff that we were working on and listen to music and have a time-honored sewing circle, which is a traditional thing as well. So I'll show you, um, I'll do a quick share screen with my stuff. Whoops. No, I didn't. Can you see? Can you see it? Did I do it? Yep, we can see it. Yes. Okay. So... Um, this is the first, um, so again, um, Marjorie, excuse the very, very, very basic weaving. <laughs> yeah, it looks as gorgeous, it's beautiful, and actually that's something I show people how to do with leftover yarn, very similar. Exactly. Well, yep. I don't, I don't, I use very little yarn. I use mostly like strips of fabric or plastic bags, and, and it's called plarn, where you, I taught the people how to use, here I'll show you one that's. This is Plarn. It's all crocheted out of recycled plastic bags. So this is a nice shopping. I didn't make this. I, I did lift it from the website. But um, um, but you can make them very sophisticated, too. I, there was another picture that's not on here. A woman had saved gray plastic black bags forever. And she she made it's absolutely gorgeous with handles and all kinds of stuff. So um, this is a hat, and you can see where it's shiny here. There's a little bit of plastic and leftover fabrics. Um, but yarn, too, you can combine all of them. And um, mostly we don't use yarn that much because it's it stretches, and I encourage people to use uh, strips of fabric that you can pull tight and make sure it's not going to tear. This is um, Amish knotting, and this is all plastic bags. So it's plastic bags for the core. Most people use uh, rope, and we're talking about where can you get the best rope, and I'm thinking don't buy rope, use plastic bags. And then this is the stitch. It's, um, it's a toothbrush, it's a, li like a blanket stitch. It's also called toothbrush weaving. So it's just this one stitch, um, and you can, like I showed you, you can make it rectangular. It's a little bit more tricky. Here's the rectangular one that I just showed you. And then this is the piece that's in the back. It's five feet long. And this is made entirely out of the seams of all the things that I cut apart, all the old shirts and all the old whatever, because the seams are a little too thick with all the stitching to use in my hats and some of the lighter weight things. So, But I saved them because, as we know, we save everything, right?
Um, and so I saved them and it took me five years, but little by little by little, I would just sit, I had this next to the TV and I would just sit and, and weave the seams. And it's really quite beautiful and now I don't want to sell it. So I'm going to keep it for a while. Now my last, oh, you can see on the bottom of the seams, see down here, the fringes. Okay, this is my new obsession. It's random fringes. And here's the ends of the fabric all stitched into fringes. And then here is the fringe sewn on the bottom of a shirt that I found very boring and now it's not. And here's fringes sewn onto the bottom of a little purse that I made. And to top it all off, here's a whole bunch of stitched fringes which will, these aren't sewn together yet, but it's either going to be a table runner or a decorative pillow on a sofa, or um, it would be a great bedspread, but that bedspread would be, I don't know, 1500 bucks. So I don't think I'll sell it as a bedspread, but a table runner with a narrow thing like going through it. So, um, and then the very smallest, I'll show you one other thing and then I'll stop. This is the smallest, smallest, little teeny pieces that are too small for fringes, I save as I work. Here's my little container that I save, and I make it into pin cushions. <laughs> I use it for stuffing for pin cushions. And um, this is tool which you can see through. So you can see, you can see through and see all the different scraps and colors with some nice buttons and stuff. This is another. This is just quilted out of fabric with embroidery, but it's all stuffed with little scraps. Can you can, oh. you, uh, can you stop screen share so we can see it closer? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, so here is, this is embroidered and quilted. And this is the see-through, look at all these little fibers. They're really pretty. And they are useful. And I make the pin cushions, I put uh, little hangers on the back. So people hang them on the wall and you can stick your pins in, which actually is very easy to find the needle with the right color thread. Um, but it also, I had one friend that um, she has a brooch that she loves. And so she hangs this on the wall and she has the brooch in there. And that's all she has in there. And she, she wears it, but then she puts it back on there. So it's sort of like a little showcase art piece for her brooch and uh that's it that's about it any that's i'll never stop <laughs> and i really love seeing a group of people last time it was just one person at a time so i'll, I'll be quiet now and let carly go thank, thank you. you thank you all right carly you want to go ahead and share oh you're muted carly all right Am I supposed, I'm supposed to pin myself? Um, I'll spotlight you. I'll okay, let me pin then. Okay, great. Um, I, I feel like, well, hi guys, everybody, and all these lovely ladies that have been talking. I wanted to like chat and jump in on all of you. And I just was super appreciative to hear about your crafts. Um, Judith, I have to just say something because I am a teacher and I teach environmental education. So you're just speaking my language right now. All this recycling and saving everything. And these are just really creative ways to help the environment. So I am, um, I'm pumped. That just like got me jazzed up. So anyway, hello everybody. My name is Carly Miller. I live in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, however, I did grow up in Carroll County and I'm also a Carroll County public school teacher. Um, I'm an environmental educator and an outdoor educator. I do a lot of fun things, including braiding. And that's why I'm here tonight. So um, I get to talk about braiding. I have been teaching for Common Ground. I'm not sure. I say this every year. I'm going to say maybe six or seven years, six years maybe. Um, it's been a highlight of my, the end of June and the beginning of July. I love to share the craft. Um, Gail mentioned that either too, like just passing this along. It's a gift and it's so exciting to be able to hand that over to other folks to learn the craft and learn that um, just the, the tips and the skills and the trade. Uh, so I teach braiding, I teach hair braiding. Um, and Marjorie, I was excited. So I have to just keep talking to you guys. It's so cool because I do the uh, kumihimo as well. And I was so excited there was a class for that with braiding as well, because it's just a beautiful, beautiful art. Um, I braid on, the class I'm teaching is hair, um, which is really awesome and super personal because it's, we're literally putting hands on in this class. 
Um, virtually, it's a, it's been a little bit challenging because uh, most of my students have mannequins, so it's not as personal and intimate. But it's making we're working it. We're making it work. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about braiding and where I started because everyone always wants to know. I actually began French braiding in third grade when I was um, in elementary school for my babysitter. And then as I grew up, I was an athlete. And so I would just be braiding uh, folks hair on the teams that I would for practices and games. And then at my school, we have a lot of time. It's a residential school in Carroll County. Uh, and so fast forward, we have a lot of time and I'm tired in the evenings. And, uh, and so I started braiding hair and getting kind of bored of the, the simple linear uh, braid. And so I decided to take it to a new level and, and kind of have fun with it. That has molded into a side business called the Braiding Booth. So not only do I teach braiding for McDaniel College, I also teach for, I do braiding parties for um, adults that want to learn, for example, on their grandkids or their kids or their nieces, whoever. Um, I do braiding parties and sometimes I even do weddings. I also work at little festivals at my school just to help out. And I have a little booth and you can come up and get your hair braided. Um, so it's fun and it's great, but I think the piece that I really want to showcase each year is the fact that it's so much more. And, and I didn't realize how much um, the importance of braiding culturally until I got to common ground because I didn't want to just braid hair. I wanted to take it to the next level. And so I started doing research my first year. And I, that's what I highlight at the beginning of class. So it's the beginning every day, I highlight um, different cultures and different time periods and different areas of the world. And I've just found all of these commonalities and it was just a beautiful thing to find patterns um, throughout the world, throughout the time, throughout cultures. And so what I've realized is that braiding is so much more than a hairstyle. It's a cultural tradition that transcends time and racial and social and economic and geographic lines. I think that's super cool. And I never would have thought about that without common ground. So in my class throughout the five days, I highlight um, tribes of Africa. We look at Native Americans um, in their tribes, uh, medieval and Renaissance times. Egyptians, you wouldn't think about the Egyptians, but Egyptians were definitely into braiding um, and even had wigs and did uh, and braided in hair, like weaving hair in. And um, the last day I kind of chronologically bring it back to um, now. And so 21st century and, and what's happening on the red carpet because braiding is still really popular. Um, a couple of thoughts, a couple of the patterns that I've looked at throughout the times is the fact that braiding has determined status um, in so many different cultures. Uh, certain folks based on wealth or social status had different braids than folks that were in the lower classes, which I think is really interesting. Um, it can bring folks together. Uh, a lot of ceremonial braids and times of war and even famine, just bringing folks together. And I think that's where I wanna end before I show you some braids myself is it's such a gift. I'm gonna bring that back. I think in, in just being able to give this to somebody, what I love about my craft, my trade, my skills are that it's people walk away with them. And it's not something that they're wearing on their person, it's literally themselves on their head. Um, and I just love to see folks when they're done, these, when kids you know, walk in and you put a braid on their hair, they, they stand up a little bit more tall and they have these beautiful smiles and they're so proud and so exciting. Um, they're so excited to have it. So what I love is that braids can affect self-esteem and confidence. And I said earlier, uh, it can affect unity. It can bring folks together, which I think is really great. Um, I can't wait for my daughter to be old enough to be on her sports teams that I can braid everybody's hair the same way and have this like unified team um, kind of mentality. So it's going to be fun. I would love to show you a couple of braids really quickly. And then if we have time, I'm watching my clock right now. I'm going to do a quick demo for you all. Um, but let's go ahead and share. And so I can show you some of these. So Virtual is not the way I like to roll. I'm sure everybody feels the same way, but at the same time, I like to also focus on the positive and there's a lot of really cool things you can do with technology. So we're gonna, we're gonna do that right now. All right, so today in class, my students were doing this and it was hilarious because it's, braiding can be intimidating much like everything else across Common Ground. And so you kind of dive in and, and dig a little bit deeper. Today, we really focused on not linear braids, but this fluidity and movement. 
And so we actually did this, I would call this a zigzag braid. Um, my students were able to do this today um, and they looked really awesome. So that's the first one. This is another one, I don't teach this one during the week. It takes a long time even for me and I'm a pretty fast braider. Um, this is just a spiral braid that ended up in a, in a bun, but it was fun. And that's not going anywhere because there's so many little tiny pieces, it's so intricate. Um, the braids that we're doing, and I'm showing a lot of techniques, they're able to sleep in them and even wear them the next day, sometimes two or three days later, um, depending on how they're sleeping at night. This is a fishtail. I think it's so great too. They're variations of braids. Um, there's so many different types of braids. A fishtail is literally instead the, the traditional is three strands of hair, but a fishtail is only utilizing two. Um, but it makes such a beautiful pattern. Um, I just love seeing the fishtail. It's just visually really a happy spot for me, but that's a fishtail braid. This one's really fun. So we're gonna uh, learn about this tomorrow in class. So this is an inverted French braid and um, oftentimes people call it the upside down braid, uh, most commonly known as the Dutch braid. So instead of going over as you're moving through your braid, you're gonna be going under and it kind of pops out on top of the head. It's so pretty. So this was just a crown braid I did at a festival. This one's so fun for younger girls right now. We have so many like princess lovers and then Frozen came out. We had Elsa and Anna. And so I call this the Elsa braid and it literally uh, resembles Elsa from the movie Frozen and it just kind of wraps around the head and then it comes down on a little side braid. Um, and girls love this. This is a really beautiful one. You can also see it when we talk about perspective. Uh, is in regards to braiding, it's really awesome because you get different perspectives that you're looking at somebody. And so you might look at them in the front, but the braids in the back. So you have no idea until you're getting this kind of big view. Um, and so this one you can actually see in the front and then on the side and then the other side it's not. So it's a kind of fun view on that one. This one, I, um, I make up the names, but I call it the cascade braid. So you're only pulling from one side and it's kind of an asymmetrical braid. Creates this beautiful roping pattern on the bottom. And it's just a nice, beautiful way to put your hair up and get it out of your face. I had to. <laughs> I don't think Linda's ever seen these and Linda doesn't even know that um, I love to bake pies. So I don't sell my pies. I don't teach about baking. I just, for holidays, I'm really old fashioned and I love making pies. And so as much as I like to braid, I got really excited and I started looking at different things I could do. So this was just a simple one. I'm saving my last one for the best. It's the finale. Um, and so I braided uh, uh, the crust really easy. I'm gonna just show you really quickly. You put your crust and you're rolling it out pretty flat and then you just make really long lines. And what's so nice is uh, the toe, I mean, it's forgiving. If you break it, you just reattach and it's just like clay and you just lay it around. I was pretty excited about this. The only problem is I didn't wanna eat it. So here is my grand finale for my braiding. I was really proud of this one. Um, this was an apple pie. Apple pies are my specialty. I was so excited about this. So we got some weavers in the crowd tonight, right? So I braided all these little strips of dough and then I wove them together. And it just, I, well, I had to put the leaves because I teach about environmental education and it's just, this is like, this is a, a Carly Miller pie. And I didn't even want to let, I didn't want to share it. I did share it, um, but it was so delicious and so lovely. And so I had to share the fact that I braid pies every year. So um, this started a few years ago. I'm always looking for new ideas and I'm trying to have fun and weave. And yeah, I've done some really crazy things with pies. These are the only pictures I could come up with. So um, I'm not gonna do a demo. I've done a demo um, all of the years prior, but I think the pies are gonna be my finale tonight. And I'm also, it's making me kind of hungry. So with that said, I just wanna say thank you to everybody else. Um, really just honored. I tell Linda, thank you so much for letting me be here. Honored to do this every year. So thanks guys. All right, so for those of you who don't know me, hi, I'm Allie, I'm the volunteer. So Linda's power unfortunately went out, um, but she has been wrapping up these gallery talks with some commentary. I know she mentioned focusing on the theme of perspective or if you saw any comparisons with your art or um, discussing your art as a craft versus a fine art. So if anybody wants to jump in um, and comments before we end, that would be wonderful. 
I obviously didn't get the memo, so... <laughs> Uh, so I didn't talk about myself and I'm not going to st sit here and talk about myself, but it has been an, an evolution as someone else used when you start weaving or you start whatever craft it is. It's been about 25 years. So what you saw tonight was about 25, well, actually 30 years of experience going in. And I do love to share what I do. And I do hope that people get hooked. I think that's the whole thing. Once you uh, love what you're doing and when I heard everyone talk so passionately about things, if you would come to my studio, you saw me at a craft show, that's exactly how I talk. So it's a little bit different when you're uh, on the computer and so on. But uh, yeah, I absolutely love what I'm doing. And I can hear everyone else say the same thing. So thank you, everyone. I would like to say thank you to Carly, because she may not remember. <laughs> but Carly was one of those people who helped me up on the fence post. She saw my work at a craft show at um, Piney Run for the Apple Festival a few years ago. And she said, you've got to go to Common Ground. So this is what I'm talking about when you open yourself up to do things that you never thought you could and then doors open and Carly opened a door for me. So Carly, thank you. I remember that it was, it was a, an amazing day. <laughs> And Gail, I'm just so grateful too that you, um, thank you. I really appreciate that you remember me because I was thinking I saw your name on the, the common ground uh, list of instructors and I'm like, she's in yeah. because I just remember I talked about you to everybody. Your, um, your craftsmanship is unbelievable. And I want all of your little animals in my house. And I was so excited. And I just love that you get to pass that along. I will be taking your class next year. Awesome. Um, when we're in person. So I promise I'm super excited, but yes, you're welcome and welcome. <laughs> I wish we could have um, email. Well, did we get emails of everybody? We did actually. Yeah, we did. So um, yeah, I've got a, cause um, my daughter found a gorgeous loom on the street. It's a French Canadian loom. I don't know what to do with it. And I was going to ask Marjorie what, who I could give it to. It's heavy. I can't send it to Pennsylvania, but anyway, but it's just been so great to, to, to share all this it's like and then gail i, I just saw all of your stuff in the background in the, in the shelves and i've got mine over there but i i have them all in plastic bags because i don't have bins so i can see and pull them all out and there's there's so much continuity between everybody um and i have never seen beadwork like joanne's beadwork it's just you can make statements who thought of that who knew that i didn't know that so Thank you all also. It's a really great company. And maybe we'll see you some in person next year if we're teaching the same weeks. Thank you. All right, thank you guys. Any last comments before we sign off for tonight's gallery talk? All right, well, thank you for joining us. Um, sorry, Linda's power went out. Uh, I know. Yeah, the struggles of Zoom, but thank you for bearing with me and for participating tonight. Bye everyone.